wonder of jets in an open sky, a streak of gray, and a cheerful... Ah! A loop, a whirl, and a vertical climb, and once again, you'll know it's time for the adventures of... Rocky and Bullwinkle and Friends. Starring that supersonic speedster, Rocket J. Squirrel, with his pal, Bullwinkle the Moose, and a host of others. Hurry, Bullwinkle! The show's about to start! I'm coming as fast as I can! Wait to the people! Yay! Now what are you doing? Sign an autograph! The thief, John Smith. But your name is Bullwinkle! I know, but that's hard to spell. and Bullwinkle really started something just by trying to bake a cake. For instead of dessert, they wound up with an explosive <laughs> that blew their stove clean to the moon. The nation was astounded. That cake batter must be a revolutionary rocket fuel. Grandma called it fudge cake. Bullwinkle was immediately made director of guided moussels, and he and Rocky set out to duplicate the recipe, which unfortunately had been torn in half by the explosion. But apparently not everybody wanted them to succeed. For when we left them last time, a scaly green hand was raising a sinister weapon and pointing it right at their heads. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle! Look there! Mm. Now, Gidney? Not now, Cloyd. Why not? I haven't scrooched anybody since we've been here. What are they, Rocky? I don't know. I've never seen anything like them. Maybe they're congressmen. Who? Who are you? Put your hands over your head, please, and no sudden moves. Cloyd here is very nervous. Yes, especially in this finger. Yeah, that's the worst one, too. What do you fellas want, anyway? Yeah, and how come the funny suits? Funny suits? They're out of this world. You're so right. I am? Yes. We're from the moon. The, the moon? moon? Yes, and if there's one thing we don't want, it's an invasion from Earth. Especially an invasion of tourists. We lead such a quiet life on the moon. Take a look at what we had to go through just to prepare for a visit here. Yeah, we had to practice dodging traffic. And listening to jukeboxes. And filling out forms. And breathing smog. And riding on subways. And regular bathing. Uh, it was awful. Seven of us were chosen. Only two made it. So you see, we must stop you from using that formula. One way or another. Well, I don't mind that one way. It's the another that bothers me. But we don't even have the formula yet. Do I scrooge them now, Gidney? Well, not if they don't have the formula. Oh, moon rats. But we'll come back. And as soon as they get the rocket fuel... Zap! Yes, zap! Bye now. And the two green men slipped out through the ventilator shaft. Hours later, as they made their way home... Moon Man! Boy! Were you scared, Bullwinkle? Of course not. Uh, you suppose I can take my hands down now? But our boys still weren't out of danger, for in his hotel room 12 stories up, Boris was readying another fiendish plan. You have the orders in code, Natasha? Yes. So translate. Let me see. These two words say, kill moose. I knew it. And look, the squirrel is with him. He's going to be a double feature. And the heavy safe hurtled straight down toward the unsuspecting pair. 
Be sure to see our next episode, Squeeze Play, or Invitation to the Trance. And now... Hey, Rocky, watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. Again? Button up my sleeve. Presto! <laughs> no doubt about it. I gotta get another hat. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. In the land of Harumph, which is pronounced like when you clear your throat, there lived an ogre. This ogre was so ugly that he developed powers to change himself so that he wouldn't have to look at his ugly face. Oh, you are ugly. I have never seen such an ugly face change to something else. <coughs> well, now you're not ugly, but man, look at those ears. Aside from being ugly, he was mean and nasty. He kept the whole countryside in slavery because aside from being uglier than his countrymen, he was also bigger, much bigger. Because of this evil ogre, a miller, tired of trying to make ends meet, died. And to his first son, an energetic type, he willed the mill. To the second son, a simple type, he willed an ass. And to the third son, a dirty type, a, that is to say, an unwashed type, he left a cat. A cat? A cat? What can I do with a cat? Cat soup, that's all you're good for. If you just cool down, I'll show you how I shall be more useful to you alive than floating around in a kettle of carrots and turnips. Explain to me, if you please, how you can be of use. Just give me a sack and your finest boots, and you'll find you are not so ill off as you suppose. Jack decided that he would give the cat a chance, but as he sat there in his stocking feet, he couldn't help wondering what Puss would need the boots for. Because that's the name of the story, silly. Puss and Boots. Puss marched out to the fields and set his bag to trap the wild game of the countryside. Puss drew the cord and marched directly to the palace. Sire, here is magnificent game from the warren of my lord, the Marquis of Carabas. Tell your master that I accept his present and I am very much obliged to him. And I order you to the kitchen for something to eat. While in the kitchen, Puss overheard two servants talking about an intended drive in the country to be taken by the king and his beautiful daughter the next day. Aha! Uh -huh. Puss had a plan. He rushed home to explain it to Jack. What? 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 Let me sleep. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's a loud cat. Stop stomping around the room and speak your piece. Ah, uh, why, I don't search out a warm lap by the fireside. I'll never know. For all the gratitude I get around here. However, sir... If you would only follow my advice, your fortune is made. You have to go bathe. Bathe? In the river and leave the rest to me. Only remember, you are no longer yourself, but my lord, the Marquis of Carabas. Bathe? This is a big thing you ask, Cat. A whole new experience, a, a different way of life. You can't rush into a thing like that. To bathe or not to bathe, that is the question. Oh, it's cold. You didn't tell me it'd be cold. <laughs> Never mind that. Shh. Here comes the king. Help! Help! It's my lord, the Marquis. Help! Oh, rueful day. Thieves, thieves. They stole all my master's clothing while he was bathing. By George, he must be a clean fellow, bathing on a cold day like this. Well, it so happens I always carry a change of clothing for Marquis in distress. <clears throat> he is size 37, isn't he? They usually are. Size 37? Right, sire. <laughs> and so Jack, for all appearances, became the Marquis of Carabas and was invited by the king to ride with him and his beautiful daughter in the carriage. Meanwhile, Puss was racing on ahead, putting up signs to lead the king to believe that all the land belonged to his master. Puss put up his signs to the very door of the ogre. Ouch! What do you think you're doing? Well, I couldn't think of passing the castle of such a noble gentleman without paying my respect. Hey, a talking cat. But talking is not half so remarkable as your many powers. 
I hear you have the ability to change. Oh, you mean uh, like this? Uh -huh. Ah, that's pretty good, you know. How about something tough, like changing into something small, you know, like a fly? A fly? So be it. Porto! Oh, there you are. Pray tell me who belongs to this beautiful castle. Welcome, sire, to the castle of my lord, the Marquis of Carabas. So all of this land and this castle belongs to you. I'm very, very impressed. But I'm much more impressed by that bath of yours. Any Marquis who would brave the elements for the sake of cleanliness is worthy to be a son-in-law. Therefore, I would be honored if you would take my daughter's hand in marriage. And so they were married. And Jack released all the people from bondage and conducted all his important business from the bathtub and lived happily and cleanly ever after. And now for the cultural part of our program, we bring you Bullwinkle's Corner with that mouth of letters, Bullwinkle. Hello there. Today's poem is from Mother Moose. Mother Goose? Goose? Must be a misprint. Anyways, the poem is Little Miss Muffet. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet. What's a tuffet? Hmm? What's a tuffet? It's what I'm sitting on, eating her curds and whey. Boy, this stuff is terrible. Along come a spider at... You're the spider? He couldn't make it. But you ain't scary. You're supposed to scare me. Okay, fellas, up. Take two. Along come a spider and sat down beside her and... Ah! A spider, a spider! Hey! Oh, well. Hey, Miss Muffet, your curds and whey are on your head. Let me tell you something. I'd rather wear them than eat them. And now it's time for... Four, five, or six baritone solos in the key of E. But... If not... Ooh. Should have tried E flat. Hello there, Peabody here. And this is the Wayback Machine for traveling through time. And this is my boy, Sherman. Speak, Sherman. Hello. Good boy. And today we visit Napoleon. No kidding, Mr. Peabody. I never kid, Sherman. Time? About 1810. Place? Paris. Hmm. The Wayback was working beautifully. We were teleported right into Napoleon's chambers. He wasn't exactly dressed to receive visitors. Who is there? Oh. You are from the Secret Service? Why, sire, is something amiss? Of course, they are gone. What are gone? The Imperial braces. Huh? The Emperor means his suspenders are missing. Oui. But why are they so important? <laughs> because they hold up my pants up. Crushing logic, sire. You can't be an Emperor without suspenders? Of course not. If I try to draw my sword, see? I cannot order the troops forward. I cannot even salute. And as for making a speech, impossible. Well, why don't you get another pair? Because I am the emperor. I must wear only the imperial suspenders. Sire, who besides you has access to your wardrobe? Only my ever faithful servant, Pierre Lecomo. And where is he? They come to think of it. I haven't seen him lately. Find Pierre and you'll find the missing suspenders. But where? There! Yes, through the palace window, Sherman had spotted a skulking figure moving toward the gate. Come on, Mr. Peabody! My dear boy, I'm a genius, not a track star. He went this way, toward the docks. In a trice, we were on the docks. Look, that ship's leaving! We'll lose them! I doubt that. When the ship pulled to a stop, Sherman and I made our way to a porthole. Inside was Pierre Lecomo and his conspirators. On the table between them were the royal suspenders. You have done your work well, Pierre. Nothing. When our general see this, they will know Napoleon is helpless. And they will attack. Then France will fall. 
like Napoleon's paints. <laughs> but, Pierre, the table is moving. How come? It's simply the rolling of the ship, gentlemen. Yes, it's the rolling of... But after them! Well, we got the suspenders. Let's run! Unfortunately, we ran in opposite directions, but it was just as well. Quickly! Unless we get those suspenders, our plot is doomed. I have got this one cornered. Peekaboo. Give me back my sword, you. Oh, very well. <laughs> How's everything, Sherman? Just fine, Mr. Peabody. That's nice. Ah, 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 ah. It's not sporting, you know. Who cares? I'm going to get you if it's the last thing I do. What do you know? It was the last thing. You little pest. I'm going to feed you to the sharks. Be calm, Sherman. My guidebook says there are no sharks in these waters. Goodbye, you brat. Monsieur Lacomo, you seem to have cut the hawser. But when I go, he goes. Not necessarily. <laughs> and as the rope parted, Sherman dangled at one end of the Emperor's braces, while Pierre Lacomo fell into the murky water. My, seems the guidebook was wrong about those sharks. Well... Now to return these to Napoleon and receive the thanks of the happy populace. They don't look happy. Something the matter? Please, Monsieur Peabody, don't take the Emperor's suspenders back. Why not? Because it is the first day in 33 years there has been peace and quiet in France. The first day the cannons have been silent. No boom, boom, boom. For years our people have had to go around with their fingers in their ears. It's the first time I've seen my daddy in 33 years, too. And who is your daddy? Napoleon. Well, we had kept the suspenders from falling into the hands of France's enemies, but there really didn't seem to be any reason for returning them to Napoleon, either. And so we didn't. There they are. That's why in all the pictures of Napoleon, his hand is inside his coat. He's really holding up the imperial pants. That's a pretty strange looking painting, Bullwinkle. I just paint what I see. Well, what do you see? This is what I see. In trying to rediscover their secret rocket fuel, Rocky and Bullwinkle have been threatened by two moon men who will go to any lengths to keep Earth tourists from cluttering up the surface of the moon, even to scrooching our heroes if need be. And if that weren't bad enough, when the boys were on their way home, the two spies, Boris and Natasha, received their latest instructions. Don't tell me. Let me guess. I'll bet it says, kill moose, right? Right. Okay. But in front are two more words. Do not. Do not kill Moose. Oh, Boris, you impetuous boy, what have you done? Better yet, what will you do? Save him! I've got to save him! Boris raced to beat the heavy safe to the ground, and he won. Almost. The heavy safe drove him into the ground like a tent stake. Bullwinkle's keen mind knew instantly what had happened. Hey, up there! You dropped your safe. Boris! Boris, where are you? Here! Yeah. Boris, darling, you're alive. This is living. In the next few days, the boys worked like demons, measuring, sifting, rolling, baking. And the results were tremendous. Seven layer cheesecakes, hot fudge strudel, an acre of cinnamon pizzas, and 200 pounds of peanut brittle. Unfortunately, none of it would explode. Golly, Bullwinkle, people are depending on us. The world's waiting for our discovery. That recipe is locked in your brain somewhere. It is? Yep. All we gotta do is figure out how to get it out. Hey, I got it. Hypnosis. Hypnosis? You'll be hypnotized, and while you're asleep, you'll tell us the recipe. I'm gonna talk in my sleep? Yeah. Swell. Usually I just snore. We'll get the world's greatest hypnotist to come here and... Who is it? It is I, Swami Ben Boris, world's greatest hypnotist. This is my assistant. Have we met before. 
Were you ever in Cairo? No. Well, that's it then. Neither was I. Now let's get to work. Shucks, you can't hypnotize me. I got too much brain power. I'm just a... Yes, master. All right. What is in the recipe? Wait a minute. You'll have to leave now. This is top secret stuff. Oh, don't worry. I won't listen. On my honor as a genuine swami. What about the lady? She doesn't speak English, do you, dear? Of course not. Well, maybe she better put her fingers in her ears anyway. Okay. At least the formula will be mine. Now, Mr. Moose, tell me everything you know. So Bullwinkle told them everything he knew, all about his early days in the Minnesota woods, his days at the Philpott School for Exceptional Children, and he was exceptional, being the only student with antlers. His experiences in the Army, where he served three years as a hat rack in the officers' club. On and on he went without stopping for 12 hours. But true to their promise, Boris and Natasha didn't hear a word. The steady drone had long since sent them to dreamland. Unfortunately, it had done the same thing to Rocky. And so when Bullwinkle finally got to Grandma's recipe, the only people who heard it weren't people at all, but the two moon men. Did you hear that, Gidney? Yes, Cloyd. It's exactly the formula we use. Oh, boy! Can I scrooge him now? Yes, Cloyd. You can scrooge him now. Don't fail to see our next episode, The Scrooched Moose. Well, it looks as if our time has just about run out. Just enough left to tell him who the sponsor was. You got the credits, Bullwinkle? All on this itty bitty card. Ooh. We're late again, Bullwinkle. Right. Bye now. See you next time.